assume, I assume everybody can see the screen. Any thumbs up? Yeah, okay. Good. Well, thank you very much, Shubayam, for the introduction. I am delighted to be here, even if it's only virtually. And it really is a great honor to be able to give um, the opening talk to this first edition of the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science that is hosted in Singapore. So congratulations to the hosting team. Uh, you are blazing uh, a new trail here. And I was also looking at the list of participants, um, those of you who are in the room. Um, and I have to say that you have an amazing group. Um, uh, you know, the combination of the participants and the dream team of organizers and, and the other speakers, I am kind of jealous that I'm not there in person. And I'm sure that this is going to be a very productive and inspiring two weeks. And on my part, I can't wait to see uh, which projects and, and research uh, come out of this edition. So hopefully this is just the beginning of a, of a long conversation. Um, let me see. So when Shubayan invited me to give this, this keynote, he, he suggested that I give a general introduction to what, uh, to, to what he called the, the lay of the land and discuss the potential and the pitfalls uh, of computational social science sort of to give you a, a starting point uh, to the more um, specific details that you will be hearing about uh, and discussing in subsequent days. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this in three parts. I'm going to start with an overview of the field of computational social science and of how the field has evolved in the past decade or so. Um, essentially, uh, two things allowed computational social science to emerge as a field, right? The first was the, um, uh, the availability of, of the eruption in a way of new data streams and new ways of collecting data. And the second was the development of computational techniques um, to exploit those uh, data resources. And so these two things, the combination of data and techniques contributed to what we could call a revolution in measurement that we are still trying to convert into scientific understanding, um, especially when it comes to uh, socially relevant questions, right? Then um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal trajectory, um, which in hindsight seems pretty linear, but in reality was anything but linear. And this is kind of to personalize a little bit, right? To, to delineate one particular trajectory within this, this broad field of computational social science that I happen to know very well because it's my trajectory. And I'm going to emphasize the social part of the equation. Um, as some of you may know, I, I was trained as a sociologist and um, it was my interest in social dynamics and collective behavior that made me become interested in what would come uh, to be known as computational social science. And also in this part of the talk, I will pay special attention to how we can extract socially meaningful insights from data that were not created necessarily for scientific purposes. And then I'm going to discuss some of the challenges that the field confronts today and the problems that, um, to my mind will shape the sort of computational social science research that we will do in the next decade. And you and your research uh, will be sort of the main protagonists in, in these next 10 years. And so hopefully I can also get to hear what you have to say during the Q&A and the discussion session. So let's start and let's start with part one. This is the part where I'm going to give you an overview um, to the field of computational social science and, and an overview of how the field has evolved in the past decade. Um, and so we start here, as I already mentioned, the two things that allowed computational social science to emerge as a field were one, the emergence of new data streams and new ways of collecting data, and two, the development of computational techniques that allowed us to exploit those uh, new data resources. In 2009, as you probably all know, Science published a short article that is now considered to be sort of the birth certificate to, uh, for, for the field. 
And these short article, by the way, also reproduce one of the most iconic figures in, in this area, right? The network visualization of hyperlinks connecting political blogs that Lara Adamich and Natalie Glanz published in 2005 um, in the proceedings of the third international workshop on link discovery. And now every time we think about clustering or communities in networks, we think about this visualization, right? Um, even though we might not necessarily be thinking about blogs anymore. Uh, but in general, the, the, this is a piece that I think reflects the enthusiasm and the excitement uh, with which researchers approached the massive amounts of data that digital technologies had suddenly made available for research. And um, you know, the, the key question that this piece posed was what value might a computational social science offer uh, to society by uh, enhancing our understanding of individuals and collectives? And this is the question that we revisited in 2020, um, uh, more than 10 years later in the second piece, also published in Science, which offers I would say a more sober assessment of what computational social science can accomplish and um, a, a more realistic understanding of the challenges that the field confronts, including ethics, uh, which goes beyond protecting privacy and, and obstacles to data sharing. And I'm going to get back to, to some of these challenges in the third part of the talk, um, but I think, you know, the field as we know it today, we can say that it was consolidated in the time that passed between the publication of these, of these two articles. Um, this is not to say that there was no research prior to 2009 that does not qualify as computational social science. So for instance, um, sociologists like Michael Macy uh, had used for years agent-based models as part of what was called computational sociology. But the institutional infrastructure necessary for an interdisciplinary field like computational social science uh, to take root uh, developed during this 10-year period. And so, for instance, um, the first international conference on computational social science took place in 2015 in Helsinki, uh, Finland. And as you know, there has been a conference every year since, um, and this is the, the main venue uh, uh, for researchers working at this intersection of fields that we call computational science, social science come together um, from all over the world, even though we are aware that these conferences have mostly been hosted in Europe and in the US, um, uh, but this is a global community and hopefully moving forward, we can bring some of those conferences to continent others than the usual ones. Um, but so, you know, the, the participants in these conferences include um, uh, academics and researchers uh, with backgrounds in economics, sociology, political science, psychology, computer science, statistics, and, and so on. And as you probably know also, the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science was launched by Matt Salganik and Chris Bale in 2017. Uh, this first edition was hosted um, at Princeton, then Duke, and then it became this huge global network of locations, um, which includes Singapore today. Um, and so in this 10 year period, the field of computational social science um, exploded in prominence. Um, there were you know, been thousands of papers that have been published uh, uh, using observational data, experimental designs and large, um, large scale simulations um, uh, that were once unfeasible um, uh, or um, kind of unavailable with, with data <laughs> or, or, or kind of approaches that were unfeasible or data that was unavailable to us researchers. And the institutions supporting computational social science in the academy have also grown substantially um, as evidenced by the proliferation of conferences, workshops and summer schools across the globe, across disciplines and across uh, sources of data. So this is all very well, like very interesting, but what, what is computational social science? We have all these um, conferences, we have these workshops, these summer schools, we have new data sources, 
but what is computational social science, right? And I'm pretty sure that many of you have heard the typical joke of, I, I use a computer, is that computational social science? Uh, well, the definition that we offer in the 2020 piece is that computational social science deals with the development and application of computational methods to complex, um, typically large scale uh, human behavioral data even though sometimes we also use simulated data. And I think the key to my mind, the key in this definition is the word complex. Um, um, as mentioned, there are some intellectual antecedents uh, to computational social science, which include research on spatial data, social networks, um, and human coding uh, of texts, uh, images, and so forth. But again, for me, the key is the word complex. I would say that um, the most important difference between computational social science and what we could call more traditional uh, quantitative social science is that traditional quantitative social science makes assumptions of independence among observations. Uh, uh, whereas computational social science deals with that complexity directly. It deals with language, with location and movement, with networks images, videos, and it applies statistical models that are designed to capture the many dependencies that exist um, within the data. And I would say also that one of the most um, salient problems that computational social science um, uh, um, tries to solve is the problem of how to extract socially meaningful insights from data that were not created for scientific purposes. And again, I think the key here is the word socially, the word socially meaningful, um, um, which is what gives the social to the computational social science. And this is a problem about which um, many of us in this community have been thinking about. Um, in this perspective, for instance, we discuss uh, what it means to be a social scientist in this digital era. Um, and so there are essentially two main ideas that we uh, spell out in this piece. The first is that we can only theorize about what we can measure, um, at least those of us interested in empirical research. So being able to measure matters, right? And the second is that the data revolution caused by digital technologies does not equate to a measurement revolution, right? So yes, measurement matters. Uh, but no, um, data uh, on their own uh, does not do not equate to um, to measurement. Um, and in particular, we really want to convey the notion that extracting meaningful measures out of all that data that we now have available is anything but uh, straightforward. And I'm pretty sure that those of you, well, most of you, or uh, or all of you, are are dealing with with this, right? With the fact that. Uh, uh, measuring things in a meaningful way is anything but easy. And the starting point of our argument is the frequently used metaphor of the telescope, right? The idea that we can now see things that we couldn't see before, and that these will revolutionize the social sciences in the same way that the telescope revolutionized our understanding of the universe, right? Uh, and so we, when we started writing this piece, we wanted to challenge this notion um, that the new data streams created by digital technologies are comparable to the development of the telescope. Um, and so we argue that this is a misleading metaphor because one, the study of societies is uh, completely different from the study of the stars, right? Stars don't get back at you when you say something about them or change behavior just to obfuscate your measurement instruments. And two, uh, we argue that it is also misleading um, because the streams of data that we obtain um, from digital technologies were not conceived for the most part for research purposes, um, unlike the telescope, right? They are repurposed in ways that telescopes are not. And so in a way, this piece is a manifesto of sorts in which we declare our conviction that digital data sources can transform the social sciences, but only if we emphasize less the large amounts of data that we now have at our disposal and we emphasize more that what matters are the measures that we obtain from those data. And this is something that I have been trying to do in my own research during the last um, 15 years. And so this is where I enter <laughs> the second part of, of this talk. 
which is the part in which I tell you about my personal trajectory um, uh, within this larger picture of the field that I just drew. And as I anticipated, my goal here is to emphasize the social part of the equation. So, you know, how the data that we have access to allow us to analyze social dynamics and collective behavior in a theoretically meaningful way. And so I'm going to try to give you a sense of how I have tried to extract socially meaningful insights from data that were not created for scientific purposes. And so to contextualize, right, this is the timeline of my trajectory within the field. And, and let me tell you that before you realize, you will be drawing similar timelines about your careers. Uh, you're not gonna be living now, but time flies. So make the best use of it, right? Because you won't realize it in 15 years will have passed since you defended your dissertation. So I defended my dissertation um, you know, this project that uh, you're all working on or just finished working on just recently. Uh, I defended mine in 2008. And this was a year before the foundational computational social science article came out um, in science. I wrote my dissertation about how the web was changing civil society and, and about the way in which collective action um, can be organized in a decentralized manner using uh, uh, what was back then this new form of communication. And I don't need to tell you that back then when I, you know, back when I started uh, my PhD in 2013, Social media didn't exist and the web was considered this technological fad that would soon perish. <laughs> and that was totally inconsequential for how um, sociologists uh, think about the world. Of course, they, they were all wrong. Uh, and by the time that I was ready to defend my dissertation, the Oxford Internet Institute was growing under the direction of Bill Dutton and Helen Margaret. And I was lucky that they offered me a job and that they supported the, the research that I was doing. And research that, you know, at the time was rather unconventional for a social scientist. I was there as a research fellow uh, until I moved to the Annenberg School uh, at Penn. And then, you know, 2015 arrived and that was my first IC2S2 conference. I went to Helsinki. The following year, I was invited to give one of the keynotes at the second edition uh, of the conference, this time uh, um, uh, at Northwestern. In 2017, I was invited to be a guest lecturer at the very first Summer Institute in Computational Social Science um, at Princeton. And the rest, as, as they say, is, is history. Um, I should mention, as Shubayan said before, that 2015 is also the year when Professor Mukherjee, who, who is, as you know, one of the leading organizers of the Summer Institute, when he started his PhD under my supervision um, at UPenn. And so, you know, it was just yesterday, right? So again, like, be careful with how you use your time because time flies. And before you realize, you'll be talking about your own grad students. All right, but looking back, sort of the, the first, I would say that the first five years of, of my career after finishing my PhD were the most important ones. And in, in the sense that I was lucky to receive institutional support for the sort of research that I was interested in that wasn't common back then. Um, and by that, I mean the support that you are all getting now through summer schools like these or through international conferences and workshops and more generally through the recognition that computational social science has consolidated in universities and, and, and across fields. But in general, I think it is true, this is true for everybody, right? Including yourselves, that the first five years of your careers will be the most important ones in defining the intellectual roots and the questions that will guide much of the work that will follow. And so the networks, the collaborations that you build during these, these uh, next two weeks um, and, and the networks and collaborations that you may build in other summer schools or institutes, conferences, they will have an everlasting influence, right? And so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that you should make the most out of this experience and forge connections that will um, stay with you for longer than you may imagine right now. Um, 10 years passed also between the moment I deposited my dissertation and the publication of my first book. And what happened in between was my, that I developed an increasing appreciation of how all this data that the internet and, and the web were making available um, um, 
allowed us to revisit some of the old theoretical questions that sociologists or more generally social scientists have been asking uh, for generations or even centuries. Now, the eruption of digital technologies is not the first technological breakthrough that um, caused awe and, and also concerns, right? Uh, um, the feeling that we can uh, suddenly measure everything that we couldn't measure before is not a new feeling. History has this way of reminding us that some things keep on repeating themselves. And one of them is our tendency to think that our times are more revolutionary than times past, right? And so, of course, we all talk now about the digital revolution and about how the digital revolution is transforming every dimension of social life, including our ability to collect data. But it turns out that many of the things that are being said today about the internet and related technologies were already being said about the telegraph back in the 19th century. And it is actually amazing how similar the enthusiastic claims, but also the fears uh, around the, um, that old technology, how similar they are to what we say today about the internet. Um, the telegraph was already creating a nervous system for the planet, uh, you know, generating all these signals for real time response to events. And it was also uh, creating huge threats to privacy. Um, uh, and also many journalists fear that the telegraph would be the end of their profession, right? It rings a bell, right? Clearly, we haven't got much better at speculating about the impact that digital technologies have on our lives. Um, what has improved is our ability to test those speculations and decode the signals that communication technologies generate as they mediate social life. And this is good because for a long time, the study of collective behavior and its significance uh, for dynamics of change and for our ability to, to design successful interventions this was seriously limited by the absence of appropriate empirical data. And in this case, digital technologies did make a difference, right? Not in our um, uh, bombastic statements about revolutionary uh, changes, but about our ability to measure things and, and to assess empirically some of the puzzles that had been concerning social scientists um, for decades. Or at least, that's the argument that I make in the book. Um, and so, you know, I, I tried to go into the roots of sociological thinking to uncover um, theoretical intuitions that were very difficult to develop before digital technologies and before computational social science made data and measurement a possibility. And so for the sociologists in the room, um, one of the stories that I um, explain um, uh, at the beginning of the book is the story of the confrontation between two of the founders of sociology as a field. Um, uh, one of them, my, my, my late colleague, Elio Katz, uh, one of them, Gabriel Tarr, would also be one of the founders of communication as a field. Uh, but so they did have a confrontation because they um, disagreed about what constituted a social fact. And this was no small disagreement because uh, what was at stake was essentially the essence uh, and the boundaries of what back then was an emerging discipline with no defined identity, right? It's sort of like computational social science now that you know, sociology once upon a time was also this emerging field of knowledge that no one really know how to delimit um, or how to kind of operationalize. And so, you know, they have very different answers to that question. The answer that Darkheim gave to the question was only social structure counts as a social fact. And what he meant by social structure were those group divisions that transcend specific individuals. So when we think about ethnicity or when we think about social class, these are the important explanatory factors that Darkheim had in mind when talking about social facts. But the answer that Tart gave to this question was very different, right? For him, the elemental social fact was imitation. And this is a term that he used to talk about contagion and social influence uh, as channeled by interpersonal communication. 
In fact, in, in several places in his writings, he laments not having access to what he calls statistics of conversation, which um, he thought would allow tracing the pathways of social influence and uncover the, the ways in which individuals become a public, right? Um, according to all accounts, Darkheim won this debate, uh, but this wasn't necessarily because he had the best ideas. Um, you know, he was an insider. He had received the support of the university system, which created the first sociology chair for him. And he was also crucially, cleverly exploiting the best available data at the time, which was essentially census data. Uh, data that, by the way, Gabriel Tart was helping collect, right? But Tart, on the other hand, in his own intellectual um, um, you know, agenda, he was interested in things that couldn't be unambiguously measured with the data that he had available. Even though um, these, these, these concepts, these, these processes were becoming um, increasingly important due to the expansion of communication technologies like the telegraph. And so, you know, in hindsight, I, I would go as far as to claim that Tart was the most visionary of the two thinkers, even though his legacy was for a long time sort of obliterated from the history of, of social thought, of sociology. And so from Tart, we can trace the genealogy of what was for a long time a frustrated inquiry into collective behavior. And this is another brief timeline of this stream of research which um, for decades uh, tried to make sense of dynamics that cannot be reduced to social structures and that include the analysis of crowds, fads, fashion, rumors, opinion formation, social unrest, and social movements. If you read this work over and over, the authors complain about the empirical limitations that they were facing, right? So for instance, in the 50s, uh, some sociologists wrote quote, collective behavior is not yet an area in which generalizations can be presented in precise form and with the backing of experimental or quantitative evidence. In the 60s, some other sociologists wrote, quote, because of their magnitude and complexity, collective phenomena are not directly amenable to observation under the kind of rigorously controlled conditions most sociologists would choose. And no wonder, right? Collective behavior is by definition spontaneous and unpredictable, and this makes it very difficult to analyze. In the 70s, things start uh, changing a little bit uh, with the first mathematical models that offer the possibility of conducting more sophisticated thought experiments. But again, those developments were limited by the fact that they could not be validated with empirical data. And this is what digital technologies finally changed, right? Underneath all the buzz and all the hyperbolic language, Digital technologies really made a difference in terms of what they allow us, social scientists, uh, to, to study. And so obviously the consequences of this measurement revolution are too far reaching for a single author monograph like my book to do justice, which is why I also co-edited the Oxford Handbook, which is a volume that um, uh, compiles the contributions of uh, dozens of scholars across the world uh, and with different disciplinary backgrounds to examine why digital networks have transformed a wide range of social phenomena from political behavior to organizational communication, from how we think uh, of space to how we accumulate social capital. Now, in general, I would say that there are three levels of analysis that digital data and computational social science uh, allow us to study. The first is the study of aggregated patterns of collective attention with a focus on temporal dynamics. The second is the analysis of uh, networks of information flow with a focus on the structural properties of those networks. And the third is the level of individual level mechanisms that make those other higher level dynamics emerge. And so, you know, these three levels of analysis are interrelated um, and the um, empirical analysis of networks uh, as they emerge and evolve is instrumental in understanding how they come together. And I think this is partly the reason why I became so interested in networks, um, uh, because they offer this connection between what happens at the level of individual behavior and what we can observe on the aggregate when we take measurements on a societal or on a group level. 
And so that's the reason also why much of my uh, past research has tried to unpack the complexity of communication networks and, oops, um, and the reasons why that complexity matters to understand the dynamics that they facilitate. And so for instance, many online networks um, exhibit a core periphery structure, which means that um, in spite of being decentralized systems that no one is really in charge of, they are highly centralized in terms of the visibility that they grant to a minority of people or um, a minority of users if, if we are talking about social media. Uh, much of my prior work also tries to unpack the fact that networks are not stationary objects, right? We need to consider the temporal dynamics of communications and decide how to best encode those dynamics in the networks that we analyze. And then um, much of my past work also tries to understand the ways in which networks trigger unintended consequences, right? So it's not only that networks emerge as a byproduct of individual decisions that are local and myopic, it is also that diffusion processes in those networks um, also arise as the unintended effect of individual actions uh, in ways that are difficult to anticipate. And this is the reason why, um, for instance, virality is such a rare phenomenon or why successful uh, massive mobilizations are also the exception, not the rule, right? If they were easy to predict and easy to anticipate, they wouldn't be so interesting. Now, but really the bigger picture here is that my interest in communication networks stems from the role that they play in several interrelated layers of our uh, societies, right? The first is the organization of collective action and in particular, the ability of what has been called the ability to organize without organizations. A second layer is the information ecosystem, right? And how networks shape our access to news, to misleading content and to other types of political information. Communication networks also reinforce and create new forms of inequalities, um, inequalities in access to information, in representation, and they are allowing for a new form of intervention that is not social or political, but algorithmic, which is blurring the boundaries between the social and the technological in ways that uh, really have no precedent in any of the prior technological breakthroughs that I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, so this is really a new and perhaps the most prominent feature of our current technological revolution. And so I kind of order these different four areas in a chronology of sorts. Uh, I started my research career with an interest in collective action and protest organization. Um, and since my research agenda has expanded uh, with the last two buckets less developed than the first two, but um, I would say that my current research and, and a lot of the research in, in the field of computational social science uh, is active in all these areas. And, um, and I'm pretty sure that many of you are also developing projects that would fit in some of these areas. And so I mean, I'm also interested in hearing about your thoughts on how to develop uh, the front, the, or how to push the current frontiers in, in these different areas. But you know, the way I thought about this when I started research um, on collective action, um, you know, it was more than 10 years ago when the Arab Spring seemed to start a, a chain reaction of protest uh, activity. You know, there was Spanish indignados and the Occupy movement and the Umbrella Revolution and protests in, in Taksim Square. And this is um, a line of research that has kept me busy, right? It's, it's, uh, I think the, the, the reason is that what matters is not so much how a particular platform allows information to diffuse in a particular way. The reason is that social media platforms or technologies are reflecting dynamics that are social, right? That are sociological and therefore that transcend any specific manifestation in any specific technology. Um, but some of the dynamics change as a function of changes in the technological affordances of those platforms, right? And so I recently published an article with a co-author, Manlio de Domenico, uh, on two episodes of Contentious Politics, the Yellow Vests movement that erupted in France at the end of 2018 to demand economic justice. And we also look at the Catalan referendum for independence from Spain, which took place in October of 2017. 
And so one of the goals that we had in this research was to determine how much of the volume of protest related activity came out of automated accounts um, or bots and whether these accounts were trying to manipulate the information circulating through the network. And again, talking about affordances and talking about uh, how people make use of, of technologies and how that use evolves over time. No one thought about bots when I was writing my dissertation and I was already thinking about how the web as a form of um, uh, of, of communication, um, you know, no one talked about bots back then, back then right? And so um, uh, the processes um, reflect the same sociological mechanisms, but those mechanisms are shaped by what technologies allow people to do. And so, you know, we wanted to test some of the journalistic claims that were being made about the influence that bots had on the information being diffused during these contentious events. And, um, um, you know, uh, it turns out that many of those accounts were exaggerated and that they don't seem to receive a lot of empirical support. Another recent example of the power of online networks in coordinating plot protests is the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protest that erupted in the US uh, and also globally in the aftermath of um, George Floyd's killing in June of 2020. And so this protest became one of the largest protests in the US history, as, as you know. They also consolidated the Black Lives Matter as a, as a global movement. And so we do have a paper covering these mobilizations that, where we, um, not only show that social activity tracked on the street uh, protests, social media activity, they were reflecting actions that were taking place on the street, but also that the stream of communication around these protests was flooded by right-leaning news sources. And um, we take this as an indication of how contested online spaces have become um, as publics and counterpublics form, but also of the influence that algorithmic curation processes have on what gets floated, um, even in the streams of information associated to progressive movements. Um, moving to the information ecosystem bucket. Here I am, uh, together with, with my team of collaborators, we are developing a research agenda that tries to understand the consequences of having transition from the broadcast era, when the number of news sources were limited and most citizens were exposed to the same information, to the current era of network communication, which is um, as you know, characterized by a long tail of media options and by rising numbers in the supply of news. And so, uh, as you know, uh, again, this digital transformation has changed uh, how news are supplied, but also how they are consumed. And so research tells us that there are uh, long tails on both sides of this equation. On the supply side, there are many sources. Uh, but only a handful of those sources attract high levels of attention. The rest create pockets of specialized or niche audiences. And on the demand side, there is a minority of politically interest, uh, interested individuals who drive most of the action we measure on the aggregate um, when we look at the reach of these news outlets. And so this small group of what we could call political junkies are creating most of the traffic and most of the attention around news and political information. And so uh, a huge fraction of the research that uh, we're doing in my group, and also a huge fraction of the research that uh, many colleagues in this area are doing, um, uh, tries to unpack all these concepts. And these are just two of the papers that came out recently of this research stream. Um, and, you know, again, like once you start analyzing uh, behavioral trace data, a lot of these theoretical expectations get debunked. A lot of the theoretical expectations that have been um, um, formulated around the impact that digital technologies have on our uh, information diets uh, are being debunked. And again, this is another example of how being able to uh, um, obtain better measurements of human behavior changes some of our preconceptions. Um, and I'm moving to the digital inequalities bucket. These are two examples of research um, on digital inequalities. I recently published an article with Isabel Langrock, who is currently a PhD student at Annenberg, where we map gender bias in knowledge representation in Wikipedia. Um, even after feminist interventions tried to alleviate existing gaps. Um, the more general question here is, 
in this particular paper is the downstream effects that bias on Wikipedia or other databases of knowledge may have, especially since these databases are being used to train automated systems, um, uh, machine learning models, or to allow, say, your home Alexa to have a conversation with you, right? So if there is a bias that is intrinsic uh, to databases like Wikipedia, then these biases will percolate through the rest of the technologies uh, um, that are um, leveraging uh, the database. And then as a spin-off, um, in a way of our work in information ecosystems, I'm also working right now with Tian Yang, who's a former PhD student and who is now um, an assistant professor uh, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So we're working on a paper where we are uh, looking at inequalities in access to political information. And here we are analyzing two large behavioral panels, tracking exposure to news on TV and the web, including YouTube. Um, we have an overlapping subset of panelists uh, um, that allow us to track what the same individuals were doing when they were watching TV, browsing the web and watching YouTube. And this is our way of identifying the political junkies that I was mentioning before but also um, the, um, you know, kind of finding the demographics of the larger set of individuals who opt out of news consumption altogether, which has implications for how we think about the role that information plays in our democracies. Is the vast, if the vast majority of people are opting out of news consumption, when, what, what does that mean about uh, uh, the way in which we think um, normatively about epistemic democracies? Um, and then there's the area of algorithmic interventions, which is something that I started thinking about more systematically when my Oxford colleagues, my old Oxford colleagues asked me to participate in a piece on future directions in research at the intersection of uh, the internet and public policy. And so I wrote about what uh, it means to demand transparency in this algorithmic uh, society, which really is not that different from transpar the transparency that we demand in research and open science. And my thoughts on algorithmic interventions have been um, greatly informed by uh, an ongoing co uh, collaborative project um, with Facebook, now Meta, um, that some of you may have heard about. There was a public announcement when we started the project back in 2020. This is a first of its kind research partnership that we started early in 2020 between the then Facebook, now Meta, and a team of, of about 17 independent researchers to study the impact that the platform would have in the back then forthcoming presidential elections. Unfortunately, um, and, and much to my frustration, I cannot say much about the findings um, until they, uh, they are embargoed, until they go through peer review. Uh, we do have findings now, and I can, you know, so, so hopefully they come out soon, but what I can talk about uh, is the logistics of what it means to demand transparency, in this case, about the electoral impact um, um, uh, of social media uh, platforms, and so, you know, being able to demand this sort of transparency requires access to pipelines uh, uh, for data extraction that go beyond what most, if not all, universities have in place. It requires teamwork over many, many hours, months, in fact, years, to come up with the right questions, the right measurements, and ways to overcome computational limits in what we can accomplish today with the current state of the art. And it requires a paradigm shift in how we do research um, across industry and academia, right? Research that has societal relevance. And so I put this type of collaborative research in the algorithmic interventions bucket because uh, one of the things that we are trying to parse out with this research is how much of what happens on social media is algorithmic amplification versus social amplification. And I don't think I will disclose anything new to you if I say that most online harms today have social roots, right? Not technological roots. And so what we are demanding of these platforms is to put in place measures that alleviate or prevent those social harms. And so those measures are by necessity algorithmic. There is no way of scaling up interventions 
otherwise. And so I would say that this is one of the areas in which the outputs of computational social science research can have the most impact. And again, I believe that uh, some of you uh, are, are working in, in this area. And so again, I will be uh, very happy to hear your thoughts about ways of developing uh, this area of work. So really algorithms permeate everything that I've discussed, including our measurements, which is, uh, so essentially what this means is that all these buckets of research um, interests uh, uh, are really not that neatly compartmentalized, right? Nothing in, in reality is so neatly compartmentalized. The levels of analysis are all interrelated and there's different areas uh, uh, or research domains are all interrelated and constantly interacting with each other. And so exploring how these themes connect with each other is uh, really where the core of my research, but also I would say the core of a, a, a huge fraction of, of, of this community lies. And of course, there's many other buckets, which uh, because I'm talking about my personal trajectory in the field, I'm not including here. Uh, but since computational social science is mostly devoted to parsing out complexity, we should never forget that complexity is also intrinsic in how we conduct research ourselves, right? And so on how we, uh, for the purposes of publishing um, uh, discrete papers or discrete books, we have to compartmentalize things, but that in reality, they are all in interacting with each other. Okay, and so, uh, in spite of how promising the research that we're doing and the research that the new data and the new methods allow us to do is, there are still many difficulties um, that we still need to overcome. And I am now officially entering the third and last part of the talk. And so I would say that for starters, many institutional structures around the field, including research ethics, pedagogy, and, and data um, infrastructures are still uh, being developed. They are still nas nascent. And so of course, um, there's also a new generation of researchers, and, and, and that means you, uh, who will shape the limits of, of what's possible. But so I thought that in this last part of my um, talk, I would, give you some pointers to how we are currently thinking about um, um, overcoming some of these difficulties. But the understanding is that this is just a starting point for a longer conversation in which you and, and your generation will, will have to start contributing or, or you are already contributing to. And so to my mind, the, the two most important challenges that we have to think about um, have to do with platform control of data access and ethics. And um, we discuss uh, these challenges in, in detail in the paper that I already mentioned at the beginning of my talk. You know, increasingly, uh, the data that we need to make informed decisions and to advise policymaking about, say, you know, how to curate online content or how to regulate the role of platforms, increasingly, the, the data that we need to, to make informed decisions lies in the hands of the platforms themselves. And even though there are a few initiatives that allow us um, to strengthen collaboration between those platforms and academic or independent researchers and you know the Facebook 2020 project that I just discussed is one of those initiatives those initiatives are not enough right they are not enough to answer all the questions that the research community has and so you know this is one of the big challenges that we are confronting today how to strengthen that sort of collaboration how to create more institutionalized forms of uh, access to data related to data access is the question of ethics and how ethical considerations might lead to restrictions in data access uh, or to the employment of anonymization techniques that add noise to the data and make it less granular and, and potentially less useful. Now, these are not easy to solve questions, but uh, and it requires solving difficult trade-offs, but the answers that we provide to these questions will delimit the research space in which we operate in, in the next decade or so. And there is also the issue on how to, in a way, align universities that were designed in the 20th century to the intellectual and professional requirements of the field. And um, this is something that we, again, also discussed in this piece that I uh, already uh, mention. Um, and so in this piece, we offer a few recommendations uh, on how to do that. The first, again, is the need to strengthen collaboration with industry, um, which will involve developing enforceable guidelines around research ethics, 
transparency, uh, research and autonomy, and replicability. Because again, like transparency is important and that requires us to be able to access data and replicate things, results, findings. The second recommendation is about designing privacy preserving shared data infrastructures that support scientific research, right? So it's, it's good to forge collaborations um, and partnerships with industry, but we also need to create um, publicly funded re research infrastructures um, that uh, overcome some of the conflicts of interest that uh, collaborations with industry always um, have to deal with. Um, and again, this is an institutional, uh, it requires institutional support in, in the form of funding um, and, and so forth. The third recommendation is uh, that you know, we need to develop stronger ethical frameworks that match the scientific opportunities uh, that new data make available, um, and but also the risks of analyzing uh, that data. And you know, during the pandemic, we confronted many of these ethical dilemmas. Right on the one hand, you want to be able to access the best available data to, um, in the case of the pandemic, to prevent uh, a, a, a deadly virus from spreading. But some of that data is very revealing about the you know, private matters of you know, mobility data that you need to be able to model how viruses spread in communities is also very revealing. Um, and, you know, and so the trade off here is, OK, so we have on the one hand uh, the, the common goal of reducing deaths, but on the other hand, we want to preserve privacy and how we solve these kinds of trade offs. Um, you know, uh, varies with the uh, it varies with the urgency of the moment, um, and so the question of what are we going to do with that data when the pandemic subsides, if it finally subsides, then you know it's a question that requires a public discussion and agreement, um, and what kind of access is legitimate access. And then the fourth recommendation is that we need to, again, to innovate in how we organize universities away from the traditional silo disciplinary boundaries and towards collaborations that are appropriately uh, rewarded. Um, and this includes things like allocating funding for this type of interdisciplinary collaboration internal to universities or, um, or having appointments across departments and schools and so on. And so all of these are institutional recommendations right, that require uh, sort of recommendations that are intended to improve uh, the infrastructures and the institutional conditions in which the research that goes under the umbrella of computational social science can, can prosper and, and thrive. Uh, I think to sum up, I think that it is crucial that we social scientists have access to the data and the measurement infrastructures without which we won't be able to answer the important questions. And so data and measurement um, infrastructures are not the goal, right? They are the means to an end. And the end is that we are in a position to tackle some of the most pressing uh, societal issues with the best available evidence while preserving privacy and the right to self-determination that we as individuals should have, right? Um, and so, you know, um, again, these are not easy to solve questions and the next 10 years will be key in, um, in determining how we solve these issues and the kinds of research that we, uh, that, that we can produce. And I think I'm going to stop here and open this up for discussion because even though I talk about all the things that I've done in my research, what I'm really interested in is in hearing more about what you are planning on doing, what you're working on. And I'm interested in learning your views about the field and how you think you can contribute to the field. So if it's okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and we can start having that conversation. Thanks so much, Sandra. Um, it was really illuminating, and I'm sure uh, those of you who um, are both have some understanding of the field versus have uh, are still new to the field uh, got a sense of what we're going to be about for the next two weeks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'd like to open the floor for any questions. So, I think we have time for um, anyone would like to ask questions. Physically, physically close. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, any questions about this? including those in the 
the Zoom, if you can also, you're also free to type out the question in the chat or unmute and ask. Still. I was gonna say someone has to break the ice, come on. Okay, sure. You want to come this is the mic, yeah. You can just this is the mic, so you can just speak close to this to the friend and you can in, introduce yourself, that'll be great also. Uh, sorry. If you can introduce yourself, that'll be great also. Uh yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um so I'm I'm currently a uh a PhD student. <laughs> Oh, I think I lost you. <laughs> okay, now I get, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm a PhD student. I'm currently working on um, commercial learning in healthcare and with a focus on like a, a kind of like privacy preserving um, machine learning across like small school institutions. And then uh, in the Kind of with the last part of the talk, you talk about like um, uh, building infrastructure about like share infrastructure that uh, kind of uh, allow multiple institutions to, to share data in a uh, privacy preserving way. Um, and uh, currently, uh, one of the kind of like uh, methods I'm, I'm, I'm working on is called parent learning. And mm -hmm. it's Kind of like you have like uh, multiple institutions and they kind of have their own data but there's this method that allow you to still like build your model on the data but without sharing any data at all so you you kind of like uh, can, can build model from multiple data sets but you don't see the data um like i, I have questions so uh, you know like the data they might have like biases so like they or maybe maybe from the the data collection process um, one example is like there might be you because of the collection process there might be like one group that is like over represent over represented in the data set um i uh and so uh usually um so like you know in in um yes like count uh like you you deal with bias in a data set when you can see the data is already complicated right so may i have a question like um, do you have any like idea on how we like count uh when we deal with like bias and fairness when we deal with data from like, multiple sources and some, sometimes we don't even like, see the data at all Mm, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I'm afraid I don't have an easy answer for that question, right? Like so, but understanding, uh, and this is partly the reason why I put so much emphasis on the notion that data and measurements are different things, right? Um, and so, determining in which ways your data may be perpetuating certain biases, or what are the, the kind of the digital shadows that are <laughs> that are um, uh, limiting the general visibility of your data. I mean, it's difficult to, to find what those limitations are, what those biases are, if there's no appropriate documentation or there's no, uh, you know, that can help correct potentially for some of those biases. I mean, no data are perfect. We know that, right? In empirical research, that's the, you know, uh, there's no data source that will be perfect, but some are better than others. And so um, blindlessly can, instead of linking different data sets uh, without a proper documentation of how that might be, um, of the biases that you're carrying forward in your analysis is, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you shouldn't do, right? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, and it depends on the context of the data. It depends on the questions that you want answered. You know, uh, it's difficult to, to give a, 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 an answer to your question that can generalize across, but it's definitely one of the first things that any analyst, any researcher uh, should think about, you know, what ways may my data be biased? It doesn't matter how large my data set is, uh, but what is it that is not represented in this data? Or, you know, are, are the measurements that we can extract from the data um uh, you know um 
bias in a fundamental way such that anything that we may conclude from the analysis of this will be flawed, right? Um, and so, yeah, when you are connecting different data sets, if each of those data sets are linked, uh, sort of are biased in different ways of the data generation mechanisms are different and that's not properly documented, like blindly just like piercing data sets together will only amplify the issue, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for letting me know about the work you're doing in this in this regard. Yeah. yeah. Any further questions? There's a question. Do you want to come? Yeah, what's your for this slide? Have long Great question. Uh, yeah. or, or you can just, you can just yeah, stand there. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, hi, Sandra. My hi. name is. I am a first year assistant professor at Penn State, actually. So I'm your noisy neighbor um, <laughs> four hours away. And my question I would like to ask you about your experience dealing with companies, uh, specifically, you know, in looking backward, what have been the biggest hurdles in terms of getting collaboration with like uh, firms? And, you know, how do you, do you overcome them? Mm. So, I mean, some, some, yeah, I mean, the, the Facebook 2020 project in particular, this is an effort led by my colleagues, Josh Tucker and Talia Stroud, who spent a lot of time making sure that the conditions were there for the collaboration to succeed. And by the conditions, I mean things like, you know, so, you know, there's a, a process, you know, of, um, of deciding which questions we want answered and then determining what data needs to be process to answer those questions and then you know how much freedom and independence we academics will have in the process and so kind of the rules of the game need to be negotiated before you start playing and so this was this is a, a you know it's a huge collaboration um and, and so you know it took a lot of effort on behalf of our leading coordinators and then once we started the we, we we started to to roll the ball then you know efforts from on behalf of all the academics but also the data scientists at Facebook to make sure that we were respecting those rules and that we were doing things as negotiated, right? And so hopefully this is, as I said, it's a first of its kind collaboration because other types of collaborations with, with, with industry are more uh, are smaller, more local about, you know, you know someone and then you start collaborating with them. In this particular case, uh, it was different among other things, because the academic researchers are getting no financial compensation. This is not a matter of you going with an internship or a, or a consulting job, right? To guarantee independence. Uh, but also the, the goal is to, in a way, institutionalize what made this collaboration work and whether we can then generalize that to other, you know, to other um, companies, uh, to, to collaboration with other companies or to allow access to any researcher to, to the, the data resources. Because that's the difficulty, right? How can we make this one-off example of what successfully, uh, sort of hopefully will be a successful collaboration? And this is something that I will only say confidently once all the papers are published, right? We are in the process, but we are not published yet. How can we generalize that so that we can institutionalize it so that it's not the exception but the rule, right? And so my experience has been it is not easy, <laughs> right? So to, to do this uh, uh, in a way that gives us what we need uh, in terms of answers to the questions that we deem important is not easy, even when everyone, industry and academics, are putting a lot of effort in this and you know a, a lot of good intentions. It is not easy, right? It takes a lot of time and effort, and it needs resources, right? And so again, like, um, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, beyond you having good research questions and good research ideas and, and, um, uh, and beyond you being able to execute a good research, you need the infrastructure and the institutional support, right? And so what I have learned is that it's not easy, but it's possible. And so hopefully once all these papers are out, we can have a more open conversation about what we all learn through this collaboration. Um, and I'm pretty sure that again, like the, the, the project uh, um, leading coordinators, uh, Josh Tucker and, and, and Talia Stroud will also talk about their own experience about how they managed to make this work. So that's one part of the answer. Of course, there's, as I said, there's also other avenues of collaborating with industry. You know, many of these companies have the ability of you for you to send either students or go yourself and spend some time doing research in situ. But then, you know, you have to think about non-disclosure agreements and you have to make sure that you understand 
what the, the process to publish is because sometimes they don't want your results to be published, right? And so uh, sometimes they want you to go there and do research and they might find useful your research for their own internal purposes, uh, but they don't let you publish it. Uh, or if they let you publish, they may not let you publish their replication materials and things like that. And so that has implications that are more specific to your own career, right? And so you're an assistant professor, you're thinking about tenure, I imagine. You know, you have to publish, you have to do certain things for you to maximize your chances of getting tenure. And so not being able to publish, having spent say six months doing research in one of these companies is, is, is it's not optimal. And so, you know, those are the things that, that you have to think about. Uh, and that, you know, as I was saying in my talk, the way in which universities operate is not necessarily aligned with how research happens in the 21st century. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so we need to do some calibration there too. Um, do you, have you had any experience working with industry? Uh, a, a little, it uh, helped me with my dissertation. So okay. Mm -hmm. that worked out. But yeah, okay. some other limited experience I had, you know, I go there, do some talk, and then uh, immediately hit 50 non-disclosure, and then things kind of stall. So mixed success, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of those collective action moments where individually there's very little we can do, but as a community, you know, uh, and, and of course, you know, there's the larger policy discussion about how, how do we hold these companies accountable if they don't open access to their data so that we can understand what they are doing and, and the consequences that they are having on society, good or bad, like we only talk about the bad consequences, but maybe some are good, <laughs> we don't know. So I, I think, yeah, I think, there's some momentum now that suggests that things may change for the better in terms of allowing researchers access to those companies, but we are not quite there yet. Um, so, thank you so much. Sure. Maybe one more question. Okay, if I then. Yeah. Hi, Sandra. So nice Hello. Yeah, I would meet each other a few days, a few weeks before. Uh, so, so nice to see you. I'll be here. Uh, so uh, I have two questions. The first one is concerning uh, your ongoing pro uh, project that you mentioned uh, in the uh, in the pretty much the end of your talk. Uh, so I was sitting in the back row and uh, correct me if I didn't uh, listen very uh, correctly. So uh, so you mentioned that you want to approach whether social media is actually polarizing. Uh, uh, like our us and uh, I, I noticed uh, a, a few months ago I, I noticed Chris Bell uh, uh, Twitter message uh, saying that maybe social media is polarizing us because we are not meant to be connected in the first place like uh, like across the uh, entire human history uh, it, there has never been uh, time since uh, we are right now that uh, human beings are so uh, all across the, uh, the entire world has been connected. So, uh, so I was wondering, uh, like, such factors might. Uh, so, so, if we are looking at like how the information uh, exposure online might drive us forward, we might look into the wrong direction, or there are, might be a, a lot of compounding variables here. So, I, I, I just want to know more about. Like your project and your thought on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, so so the, the one part of this process that I'm really interested in is can we disentangle what is um, social choices from algorithmic choices, right? And by that, I mean, when you use social media, you decide who you want to follow, right? And so the networks that you build online are not necessarily identical to the networks that you would have offline in the absence of those technologies, but they're still your networks, right? You still have agency, you still decide who you want to follow and who you want to um, engage with. Um, and that's what we could call a process of social curation. You decide <laughs> which groups you belong to, who you're gonna pay attention to and so forth. Now, this still creates the problem of how what information out of everything that bubbles up from that network is shown on your feed right and so most of these social media platforms 
operate with a feed that gives you uh, a selection, shows you a selection of everything that you could see. And so that's a function of what your network is publishing, right? It all bubbles up. It's whichever posts, videos, or URLs, your network contacts decide to post. That's a set of content, right? And then from there, you have a process of algorithmic curation that determines what exactly are you going to see out of everything that you could see, kind of, right? And so, um, uh, and so, you know, these are, there's a constant feedback loop between the two things, right? Because as far as we can tell, like algorithms are kind of black boxes that we don't fully understand, but these algorithms, the curation algorithms that determine the information that you see are using social signals that derive from your behavior, the behavior of your contacts in the network and a bunch of other things, right? And so it's a combination between human choices and algorithmic choices. And we don't fully understand, and that's the, the, the fact, right? There's no scientific understanding about, there's some, there's a couple of papers that have been, have been published, but we still don't quite understand how this feedback unfolds. <laughs> And what part of the feedback, so what part of what we see and do online results from our choices versus uh, what the technologies encourage us to do kind of. Um, and so, you know, back to what Chris published in, in Twitter, I, um, I, I don't know if it's true that we are not meant to, to build the networks that we are building. There's so many things that we are anthropologically not meant to do or be. <laughs> we are not meant to wear glasses either, or you know, we are not meant to use computers. We are not meant to do a lot of things that we didn't evolve <laughs> necessarily to do the things that we're doing. So I'm not sure that's true, right? But what, what really matters is, um, you know, are we just using a, like a, a um, are we just using a scapegoat uh, to, to find something to blame in, in these platforms and in these algorithms just because it's easier than trying to understand the complexity of the problem, right? And so, the, you know, I, th I think that it's, it's a temptation to always blame it on technologies or the platforms or the algorithms for things that go wrong because it's way harder to look at us and, and to realize that we are the problem. And of course, I'm simplifying what could be a very complicated question, but uh, to, to me, this is an empirical issue, right? And we still don't quite understand what causes what, right? Is it the algorithm? Is it our choices? What, what is it, you know? Um, so, but hopefully people like you can help us understand this better. <laughs> well, I was also like thinking about what is another chicken or egg question again. But uh, it's interesting to how it unfolds. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we can move it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi. 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 Yeah. Um, so my name is Amy. Um, I'm actually a psychologist, so quite new to the computational side of things. Welcome. Um, yeah. um, kind of one uh, question to like check my understanding and then I follow on onto that. So one was against um, algorithmic interventions. So is this a, checking my understanding that you're referring to changing algorithms or social media so we see different things to what we are currently doing? Um, and then the follow up to that is kind of how likely do you see companies actually adopting this if say we can show that um, if you change your algorithms this way and it has a positive benefit? how likely the company to adopt that given that I guess at the moment uh, most of the uh, algorithms around kind of adverts and kind of promoting and getting the best out from them uh, kind of and how that balance could uh, play out. Yeah good questions yeah I mean I don't have a lot of confidence in social media companies whose whole purpose is to improve their bottom line <laughs> it, how interested they are really in making in making society better necessarily right so I'm not sure they would voluntarily uh, necessarily do whichever recommendations we social scientists have about what they should be doing. Uh, but being a little bit less cynical, there is, you know, two ways in which this matters. Like these companies are constantly doing research internally and they do make changes to in how they operate on the basis of the research that they produce and the data that they analyze. And it's just that it's not public, it's opaque and we don't know about it, right? But sometimes I wonder how much 
farther we could advance in some of the open debates in the academic literature, we had access to the data that has already been generated internally in these companies that we just don't have access to, right? So they do, um, internally, they do make changes, right? But we don't know how, when, or... <laughs> But also there is increasing um, public pressure and it's gonna be it's increasing pressure to regulate these companies and regulations require evidence, right? The evidence-based policymaking requires data. And so um, maybe these companies are not willing to introduce whichever changes we decide can make things better, but this is why we have regulatory efforts to kind of enforce uh, those uh, force them to to enact those changes, right? And again, I'm not necessarily sure that the regulations that are currently being discussed uh, will make a difference in terms of how these companies operate. Uh, but I think they will have an impact. And so, when the time comes, we want to be ready to be able to produce the sort of evidence that can help inform uh, those interventions, right? Um, the other part of the answer is that, you know, some questions are really tough to, <laughs> so it's easy to say, oh, let's analyze data so that we can de design interventions that are effective. It's, this is always easier said than done, right? Then you do the research and you realize that things are not so straightforward. Uh, but um, I think that's the case with all sorts of research in general, right? But I do think you don't need the companies to be willing to change. I mean, there's other avenues to kind of force that change, right? If they're not willing to do it themselves via regulation, for instance. Thank you. So, um, maybe I can like, say something here, like, uh, like ask a question for Sandra. So, if I... So I'm just interested to know, like, what your thoughts are on this, Sandra. And I think it's, if I were a graduate student now, for example, I feel that, um, or at least when I was a graduate student like seven years ago, it felt easier to get stuff done in computer science than it is now. For example, back then, sure, now you have more methods, you have better computers and all that. But back then, Facebook had an API that let you get data, right, for example. Um, if you were doing online experiments, people, uh, online ex participants were less um, bad, they were better online. Like, <laughs> empirical were, were doing a better job at doing, doing experiments. But now it feels as more and more people have been doing experiments online, more and more people, and Facebook have had this, the whole controversies about, you know, their data uh, issues. Uh, it's become increasingly difficult to do computational social science research unless you are already, unless you know the right people or unless you uh, know, you have a lot of money to recruit good participants for your experiments and so on, right? So even though we, this is paradox, even though you know you have better computers, you can analyze more data, you have more methods, you, you, have, you, can, you can you have better tech. But somehow, if I were a grad student now, I would feel more inhibited in kind of entering this field. Like I would feel like more, um, how do I do anything? Like okay, there's Twitter, but Twitter is kind of everyone's been using it for forever, and they have made it easier. But I mean, the real world lies outside Twitter, to be honest, right? So we, and I'm saying this knowing that next tomorrow we have a speaker from Twitter coming here. So, so we're talking about you know getting Twitter data. But um, how do you feel this has changed also, or is it just me? And if I'm correct, how how what did you say to like grad students? So how to enter this, uh, get into this game? Hmm. Um. I I don't know. I mean, so I think what's happened is that the field has matured a little, so we understand a little bit better what the, the strengths and the weaknesses are, right? Like, so I'm not sure if it is easier today to, to so if it was easier in the past to do research than now, because, you know, yeah, maybe it's true that, you know, when I was a grad student, researchers were using, um, we're building their own experimental apps that they would run on, on Facebook to collect data. And this is Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica became a scandal because some researcher at Cambridge University in the UK where you know, they build an app like that, that Facebook lets you run on their graph. And you could collect data from everybody, including those who hadn't signed up uh, to use that app. And, and then you know because of scandals, partly produced by lack of uh, 
I don't want to say ethical, but so be, because of mistakes made by academics that were then exploited by other actors, you know, these companies started being more restrictive about the data that they were giving access to, right? So, but I'm not sure, you know, back, back in the day, it was so easy for the average grad student in the social sciences to know how to build their own app so that they could collect data from social media. And we, we didn't have the, it's not that we didn't have the training, we didn't even have the language to do, to do that, right? And so, you know, so, you know, if you put that in a balance, so yeah, maybe it was easier to run experiments on Facebook or collect the data from Facebook because Facebook was way less care, careful with, with their data than they are now. But like we didn't know how to do it because we didn't even know what an API was, <laughs> right? So I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I do think that when a, a field matures and there's more agreement about what the standards of evidence are and what amounts to good research or bad research, you know, um, things become more demanding, right? Like so, it becomes more difficult to publish because the bar is higher and things like that, right? Like because you are not discovering a new continent anymore. There's already a map. There's you know there's already people are building things, and so um, the standards that changes the standards, right? Um, um, but I think that's good. That that's a good sign. Like you are on average better prepared than any of my peers and me included when we were in your position, right? When I was a grad student. We didn't have half of the training that you have today. And so you are better equipped so that we should demand more of you, right? We should demand more of everybody because we know more, we are better. And so um, so I, th I think I understand why you have that feeling, right? Um, but as a grad student, it, it's true also that you always wonder, how am I going to contribute? How am I going to make a difference? How and, and you don't realize that when you're a grad student, really the sky is the limit in terms of what you can learn and what you can accomplish, right? Um, and I don't think that has changed, right? It's, re it's still possible. I would say that there's more things that are possible now in terms of research than they were in the past. Um, but I do understand why you might have that feeling, Shubaya. I mean, I think this is... Um, a little bit like the, the glass that is half full of or half empty. <laughs> I think, you know, we our impressions of what's easier or difficult also depends on 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 our you know our own predispositions to think nostalgically about the past versus um, not nostalgically about what's coming, right? And so I'm not sure I'm not sure I agree with the conclusion, but I can see why you feel that way. I, I still suspect that you know you are all of you in a much stronger position to make a contribution than we were when, you know, we were, when I and my peers were grad students, just because you know, we didn't even know what was possible back then or, you know, or, or what we could do. Um, so, yeah, so I, I still, you know, I, I have high hopes uh, and I'm pretty sure you will deliver all of you uh, uh, in this Institute as you should buy and deliver yourself. So, so be demanding with your students. That's all. <laughs> Any further questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sandra. Uh, hi. Thanks for the talk. My name is uh, Inkyo from uh, NUS Computer Science Department. Maybe just a just a quick question on a computational side of the course. Yes. So, got background in sociology, so I just wanted to hear from you. Perhaps what where, where do you think the computer scientists or the data scientists can? contribute more. I guess to put it another way, what, what is your wish list for the computational side of the house to, to bring them to, to, to the whole uh, CSS and them? Everything, everything. I mean, the comp I mean, I emphasize the social part, but the computational social science without computational is nothing. <laughs> um, and so, um, it's not so. so it's, some of my colleagues would say that uh, computer scientists um, don't necessarily have problems. They want to offer solutions, right? You bring the problem, they give you the solution. I don't agree with that. I think computer science as a discipline has a way of thinking about problems that is super valuable in itself, right? In terms of defining the boundaries of the uh, of of your research, and in terms of defining. Um, the parameters and how you will operationalize and break down and kind of the modular structure of, of how computer scientists think about solving a problem, right? Like so, um, which is epistemologically, it's very different with, from how social scientists 
have traditionally been trained to think about what's a social problem and how you, do you solve a problem, right? And, um, and so it's not just, so, so this is me saying that the com computer science part of these, and you know, I worked a lot with physicists myself uh, and, and applied mathematicians via network science, right? And so networks is also one of those lingua francas that cut across disciplines. Um, and so to me, it wasn't only that by collaborating with colleagues in more technical disciplines, I could improve the tools that I was using uh, in my, uh, to, to answer my questions, right? Uh, it was also that the, the, the way to formulate a problem changed and the way to execute a research design to solve a problem changed. Um, and, and I found that immensely valuable. And I think that's immensely valuable for the field as well, right? And on the flip side, that creates issues sometimes for collaborations, right? Like that, you know, that creates <laughs> obstacles and sort of sometimes, you know, it's, it is difficult to, to find a common ground and to find a common language because you come from such different, you know, expectations of what counts as a, you know, even what is a theory, right? Like I talk a lot about in my talk about sociological theories, but even what is a theory, the answer to that question changes depending on whether you are a mathematician, a physicist, or a computer scientist, or a, or a sociologist, right? Like we have different definitions of what counts as a theoretical contribution. Um, but I think the, the, the value of, of computational social science and you know, the past 10 years, there's been enough work done in this domain that I think we have now a, a common ground of common understanding. And we do understand that you know, there's an intersection where we can all work productively together. And then of course, each of our, of our disciplines you know, there's pockets of, of, of debates or, or issues that we can only solve with other sociologists or with other computer scientists, right? And that's when you don't do computational social science. I think computational social science is the magic that happens when you have all these, you know, when you, when you work on this common ground of mutual understanding uh, uh, in terms of what is a problem, how do you solve a problem, and what counts as a theoretical contribution. Um, but yeah, I could talk for hours about everything that I have learned uh, from from colleagues in computer science or, or physics or, or math. Um, and it's not just the tools, right? It's the way of thinking, the epistemological approach to, to finding answers to questions. So. Okay. We have time for one last question before uh, any final questions. Okay, this is okay. Yeah. Hello. 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 Uh, my name is Oman Cardinway, uh, SMU, a uh, computer science PhD student. So um, uh, I, I want to ask a slightly uh, practical problem. So in a uh, in the social networks, so there, there can be a data structure like the graph. So uh, how do you think the, that uh, that structure can be uh, further applied uh, by the by the like the computational uh, techniques, or to say the AI models, like the current very uh, very hot like the graph models in the artificial uh, artificial intelligence field. So uh, how how can they be uh, integrated? With those uh, graph models and uh, between the graph models and the uh, and like the uh, uh, graph uh, data structure in the in the social networks, yeah, that's my question. That's my question. Okay, so let me let me repeat and so make sure that I understood. So the question is whether there is um, some connection between how we think about social networks um, uh, and how we use graph theory to make sense of. Uh, so to build some of these machine learning models, is that the question? Uh, yeah, kind of. The, yeah, it's more. Uh, it's more like the more more. High, uh, it's kind of a high, higher level, so um, not too much uh, technical uh, technical details. It's just to how we can uh, how we can better analyze the uh, the data structure of the graph in the in the computer uh, in the social science field. That look like the social medias. There are many uh, graph structures, data, like the different peoples uh, following each other, like in yeah. the game. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, social, social scientists have been analyzing networks forever. Um, uh, but when, but, but so the eruption of digital technologies changed completely how we theorize about networks just because it scaled things up, right? So traditionally, you could only analyze networks on a very local level for very small groups. And so when email started uh, emerged as a form of communication, the internet, the web, and so forth, that allows us to look at social networks in a different way. But uh, net, so uh, networks are, again, they are um, a theoretical construct in the sense that they don't exist ontologically. There is no social network out there that we want to approximate with our research, right? Depending on the, the platform that you're using to collect your data, depending on, you know, on what's available, um, uh, the, the network that you will build will change. And, um, and so, you know, we have gained some understanding about how the topology of communication structure shapes dynamics of information diffusion. We have understood how self-organization, right, which is something that as, as a sociologist interested in collective behavior, this is what we needed that we never had, right? Like, so suddenly now we have um, this X-rays of how, you know, when people come together and organize in the form of a protest, what kinds of communication structures underlie that process, right? Um, and so, but I think what, and, and I'm not, I'm still not quite sure if I understood your question, but I, I do think that um, the difficulty here is that again, like social networks are theoretical constructs. They are also mathematical tools, like graph theory is based, I mean, you can analyze networks of, as mathematical objects that may or may not have a correspondence with the world, right? And so for a long time, mathematicians use random networks and then regular networks, and then none of the networks we observe in the real world are random or regular, right? They have other structural features. And so, but, so, you know, but, I think what's difficult from a from a social science point of view is that there is no way of ascertaining whether, for instance, one question before asked, so maybe we were never meant to build the networks that we're building now. But it's not that we, you know, but you know, when we compare the networks that we built online, we don't have a clear benchmark of what what are the natural social networks that we would build in the absence of technologies, partly because the only way to measure those networks is through the use of technologies. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, the, so, so that's one part of my answer and, and you know, I'm going to give you a second part of my answer that maybe it's not addressing the question directly, but the other application of network theory or kind of graph theory that I think is super fascinating has to do with meaning and with measuring um, symbolic uh, structures and right? how we relate concepts, for instance, more cognitive perhaps, but this is, you know, when you have an opinion about some policy issue, how is that related with your opinions about other policy issues, right? And so you can represent those associations that are symbolic that they have to do about how, you know, when you think about uh, one concept, what is the next concept you think about? Um, that's a relational data structure that um, we can now analyze um, and, and the results of those analyses may fit these models of artificial intelligence that may or may not work because there's a lot of, <laughs> you know, there's very little intelligence in some of those models. But so, and, and so again, I think because, you know, in the digital humanities, we are now, an, we are in a position that we can analyze like centuries of books and literature. And so we can uh, try to infer from that data how concepts and ideas relate to each other and how those networks of relatedness change over time. And we can then analyze how, what that means about changes in public opinion or changes in culture. And this is very qualitative in substance, but very quantitative in the execution, right? Like, so, you know, you have professors in literature now analyzing huge databases of, of books to, to infer some of these structures, right? And I think, again, this is fascinating. It's like, there's magic happening here too, because it's the intersection of fields that had not much to say to each other. And now suddenly they are talking to each other, right? So, <clears throat> So again, I'm not sure I answer your question, but I think, you know, I, I think so very uh, perfectly answered. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, Sandra. Um, um, so I think we think have kept you up long enough. It's probably about 10 p.m. there, right? Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So, Thank you for uh, talking about your personal trajectory as well as introducing um, the field to our participants.
So to be fair, um, this was the first event of six Singapore. And so we haven't even yet had the introduction round. Uh, so we'll be having it after your talk. So, okay. uh, but yeah, thanks um, for uh, kind of kick, like, like, like kicking things off um, for the first ever six uh, in Singapore. So, That's great. And, and congratulations to you, Shubaya, and the rest of the organizing team for, for pulling this out. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see, to see the new generation building things and doing things. And so, so it's really an honor for me to be part of this. Good luck with the next two weeks and let's stay in touch. Thank you. There's no better way, I think, to uh, start six in you know, Singapore uh, you know, than what Sandra just gave us. So, so we should give her a huge round of applause if you can do it. Thank you so much. The only thing I, can, I hope you can do better is to join us with our tea break. I mean, tea and coffee is ready outside, and uh, 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 Lillian will be serving you the snacks. But you can feel free to take the tea and coffee, uh, use them in the uh, green wall lounge outside. Mm -hmm. But we were told we were not supposed to bring the tea and coffee right. inside. Water is okay. All right. So, Sandra, hopefully next time you can join us uh, physically in Singapore. All right. Yeah. I hope so right. too. Sorry, my video just stopped. I hope so too. See you soon. <laughs> bye, -bye. bye. Bye. All right. Mm -hmm. uh,